Well, it's, it's a privilege to be with you this afternoon. I'm grateful for the hospitality uh, that's been shown to me already. Uh, it's always wonderful to be back on the campus of Southeastern, which uh, so influential in shaping me intellectually, spiritually. Um, and I'm excited to workshop something with you today. I'm starting a project on divine attributes, approaching it under the angle of the classical rubric of the divine names. And this is kind of a first stab in that direction. And so if it's terrible, you can save me and many other people by telling me so. Um, but let's jump right in. Patti Smith, yes, that Patti Smith, begins her autobiography, Just Kids, by recounting an episode of naming from her childhood. When I was very young, my mother took me for walks in Humboldt Park along the edge of the Prairie River. I have vague memories like impressions on glass plates of the old boathouse, a circular band shell, an arched stone bridge. The narrows of the river emptied into a wide lagoon, and I saw upon its surface a singular miracle. A long, curving neck rose from a dress of white plumage. Swan, my mother said, sensing my excitement. It pattered the bright water, flapping its great wings, and lifted into the sky. The word alone hardly attested to its magnificence, nor conveyed the emotion it produced. The sight of it generated an urge I had no words for, a desire to speak of the swan, to say something of its whiteness, the explosive nature of its movement, and the slow beating of its wings. The swan became one with the sky. I struggled to find words to describe my own sense of it. Swan, I repeated, not entirely satisfied. And I felt a twinge, a curious yearning, imperceptible to passerby, my mother, the trees, or the clouds. Smith's account highlights a number of features integral to the act of naming. We inhabit a world of wonders that present themselves to us, a world of singular miracles with long curving necks that rise from white dresses of plumage. Part of our participation in this world of wonders involves naming those wonders. In naming the sensible, intelligible goods the world presents to us, we identify them swan. However, acts of identification are not exhaustive of what we do in naming the wonders that the world presents to us. We identify, Paul Ricoeur observes, with a view to describing more. Beyond the act of identifying the world's sensible and intelligible goods, we also attempt, if only feebly, to attest their magnificence and to convey the emotion they produce within us, to say something of their whiteness, the explosive nature of their movement, the slow beating of their wings. Naming, furthermore, is a social activity, an exercise in what philosophers called shared intentionality. A singular miracle captures a daughter's attention, and her mother introduces her to its name, drawing upon a common stock of language, furnished with a common stock of classifications. Naming is a social activity in which we identify, describe, and evaluate common objects of love by means of a common language. Well, the theme of my lecture is not the magnificence of a swan, but the majesty of our God and the manifold names by which he presents his majestic being to us in scripture. A few words in general about this theme are in order. <clears throat> According to the Lutheran theologian, uh, Johann Gerhard, <clears throat> our knowledge of God in this life is almost completely grammatical. What does this mean? Strictly speaking, God cannot be named. This is not because God's being is opaque, unintelligible, or unutterable. God is a supremely intelligible good. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. The Father knows and names the Son. The Son knows and names the Father, whose being he perfectly expresses as the Father's eternal word. And the Spirit searches the infinite depths of their mutual knowledge and naming. God cannot be named, categorized, or evaluated according to the ordinary grammar of human naming because his glory categorically transcends the worldly wonders that the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming is designed to identify, sort, and evaluate. 
The greatness of the Lord is unsearchable. The glory of the Lord is beyond all blessing and praise. God dwells in unapproachable light. Nevertheless, because the depths of God are also depths of love, God condescends to name himself in human language, taking up the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming and thereby conveying something of his transcendent being, character, and worth. According to Francis Turretin, because all our knowledge begins with a name, God assumes various names in scripture to accommodate himself to us. It is for this reason that our knowledge of God in this life is almost completely grammatical. Our knowledge of God is a knowledge by names. The manner of God's self-presentation to us in scripture thus sets the agenda of theological study. On the one hand, if our knowledge of God in this life is almost completely grammatical, we must devote ourselves to what Gerhard calls devout meditation on those things that have been revealed about God in scripture. As Basil of Caesarea affirms, not one of the words that are applied to God in every use of speech should be left uninvestigated. Indeed, according to Basel, the investigation of syllables does not fall outside the goal of our calling. On the other hand, we must avoid what Gerard calls the rash investigation of matters that have not been revealed. Since the divine benevolence has revealed to us what it was expedient for us to know, John of Damascus counsels us, let us be content, and in them let us abide, and let us not step over the ancient bounds or pass beyond the divine tradition handed down to us by the law and the prophets and the apostles and the evangelists. This will then be the focus of our lecture, how God presents himself to us in Holy Scripture by means of the divine names, and how we, with magnanimity and moderation, may learn to approach, to appropriate the divine names. Specifically, I want to focus on the nature and scope and ends of divine naming. As we'll see, God conveys and communicates something of his transcendent being to us by means of the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming. In so doing, he endows a community of divine naming wherein we may learn to call upon his name in prayer, proclamation, and praise. Guided by the conviction that good dogmatics both derives from and leads to biblical exegesis, we will begin our lecture with a brief analysis of Revelation 4 through 5 that will set the agenda for our theological reflection. We will conclude our lecture with an analysis of Psalm 145, attempting to demonstrate the fruits of theological reflection for biblical interpretation and piety. So first, Revelation 4 and 5. Revelation 4 through 5 opens the door to a vision of what John Baer calls monarchical monotheism a vision in which God is seen as presiding over the heavenly court in the celebration of the heavenly liturgy. The heavenly court is the place where the reign of the triune God is visibly manifest, where the worship of the triune God is worthily expressed, and whence the purposes of the triune God for creation as a whole are both revealed and enacted. We may appreciate this text's instruction for theology of the divine names by considering first what it says about the course of divine naming, and second what it says about the character of divine naming. So the course of divine naming. John's vision begins with a summons from Jesus' own voice. Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. And Revelation 4.2 says that John receives this summons in the Spirit. The origin of divine naming is the triune God himself, revealing himself to and through the apostolic embassy and through John to the seven churches. The divine origin of divine naming in this text and others at once grounds the utter reliability of John's testimony. These words are trustworthy and true, says in chapter 21. It also grounds the beatitude pronounced upon those who read hear, and keep the words of John's prophetic vision. Revelation 4 through 5 presents what, from the vantage point of classical Reformed theology, is the consummate expression of human praise of God, and thus of human naming of God, that of the glorified saints in heaven. In opening the door to God's heavenly court, Revelation 4 through 5 opens the door to the chorus of heavenly creatures and redeemed saints who have learned in the spirit 
and by virtue of the triumph of the Lamb, to praise the name of the thrice holy God with perfect eloquence. By showing us the human praise of God in this consummate form, Revelation 4-5 through thus sets the standard and the goal for pilgrims who are still on the way to our everlasting rest, that we might gain, by the same Spirit, and by virtue of the same triumph of the Lamb, the fluency required to make us fitting participants in that heavenly chorus. But there's a conflict that is introduced in Revelation 4 and 5 as well, and this conflict is related to divine naming. While the heavenly creatures perfectly hallow God's name in view of his eternal and sovereign being, and while they perfectly praise God's name because of his works of creation and providence, the revelation of a scroll in God's right hand suggests, that John, suggests to John that all is not well in the heavenly vision of Revelation 4 through 5. The scroll likely signifies God's sovereign plan for creation as a whole, a purpose which we can infer both from the immediate context of these two chapters and from the broader context of the scriptural allusions which this text evokes. In short, God's sovereign plan for creation as a whole is that not only in heaven, but also on earth, that his name would be hallowed. The problem, according to Revelation 5.3, is that no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. No one among all God's creatures is worthy of understanding or affecting God's purpose for creation as a whole. And for this reason, John weeps. But this text also describes a triumph of divine naming. John's sorrow is quickly assuaged when one of the heavenly beings announces glad tidings. Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. John then looks and sees a lamb standing as though it had been slain, who proceeds to take the scroll from God's right hand. John then hears the heavenly creature sing a new song, extolling the triumph of the Lamb. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you are slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. The triumph of the Lamb is thus a triumph of divine naming. In ransoming a kingdom of priests for God, the Lamb has invested a people with the authority to lead all creatures in the praise of the triune God, thus fulfilling God's sovereign plan for creation. And this is exactly what we see. As a result of the Lamb's triumph and the ensuing authorization of this kingdom of priests, God's purpose for creation as a whole is realized. Not only myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands of angelic hosts in heaven, but also every creature in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them, begin by the Spirit to render praise to God and to the Lamb. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Well, Revelation 4-5 through not only reveals something about the course of divine naming, it also reveals something about the character of divine naming. Though we are sometimes lulled into thinking that God's use of the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming means that God is just one more item, perhaps even the greatest item, within the realm of creaturely being, Revelation 4-5 through 5 alerts us against this line of thinking. Apocalyptic literature deploys ordinary language in extraordinary ways. In so doing, it reminds us that God, in taking up the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming, seeks to convey something of his transcendent uniqueness, incomparability, and holiness. Revelation 4-5 through 5 exhibits three features regarding the character of divine naming that we will expand upon more fully in the sections below. First, the nature of divine naming. Revelation 4-5 through 5 does not locate God among the world's panoply of creatures, but instead locates him above all creatures, identifying him as the one who sits on the throne. It also locates him at the center of all creatures, encircled by four living creatures, by 24 elders, and by the heavenly expanse that separates heaven and earth. In locating God at the center of all things, this text identifies God as the one from whom and to whom all things in nature, grace, and glory proceed as their alpha and omega, 
their beginning and their end. Revelation 4 through 5 also identifies God by means of his unique divine name, the Lord God Almighty. In this case, a Greek surrogate for the Hebrew proper name and title, Yahweh Sabaoth, and by means of his eternal and sovereign being as the one who was and is and is to come. Revelation 4 through 5, moreover, ascribes various attributes to God, appropriating divine power and divine knowledge to the Spirit of God and of the Lamb. It also describes the various works of God, extolling him for his works of creation and providence, and also for his works of redeeming and perfecting a people for himself from every tribe and language and people and nation. Revelation 4 through 5 finally exhibits praise to God in various ways. By means of the trisagion and the various doxologies of heavenly creatures, and by means of a new song that celebrates the triumph of the Lamb, and by means of the praise offered in the Spirit to God and the Lamb by all creatures in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Revelation 4 through 5 expresses God's transcendent holiness, glory, and worth. That's the nature of divine naming. The scope of divine naming uh, is manifest in several ways. God is identified. God is described. God is praised. The scope of divine naming extends to God's being, to his attributes, to the persons of the Trinity, to their works, and to their worship. And in this way, Revelation 4 through 5, to borrow Walter Brueggemann's language, represents God's name fully uttered. The end of divine naming. In Revelation 4 through 5, the triune God reveals himself to and through John's vision to the seven churches and to all who read, hear, and follow John's vision by means of various acts of divine naming. Revelation 4 through 5 identifies, describes, and praises the triune God and his being, attributes, person, works, and worship. Moreover, as we've already seen, the end of divine naming, according to Revelation 4 through 5, is that by virtue of the Lamb's triumph, a kingdom of priests might lead all creatures in ascribing blessing and honor and glory and might in the Spirit to the thrice holy God and to the Lamb. The end of divine naming is that we might learn to call upon God's name. Well, in the remaining sections of, of the lecture, I want to focus on these three aspects of divine naming the nature of divine naming, the scope of divine naming, and the ends of divine naming. Tease uh, each of these topics out a bit more fully. So, the nature of divine naming. God presents himself to us in Holy Scripture by deploying the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming in an or extraordinary way, thereby conveying something of his transcendent uniqueness, incomparability, and holiness. As we noted in the introduction, the world presents to us a series of sensible and intelligible goods that we, as intelligent creatures, find ourselves seeking to identify, sort, and evaluate according to various hierarchies of value and worth. Language is essential to the distinct activities of identifying, classifying, and evaluating the various wonders that the world presents to us. It is only in naming various sensible and intelligible goods that we are able to fully receive them, enjoy them, share them, and rejoice in them. Moreover, the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming is a social enterprise in which there are producers and consumers, those who occupy a normative position vis-a-vis -vis the grammar of creaturely naming, and those who occupy the position of learners. And there's something to be developed there about the, the nature of, of, of naming and theology, but for the sake of space, I'll, I'll leave it alone. Naming thus understood involves several paradigmatic activities. In naming, we identify things. We refer to this tree, this cheeseburger, or this man, singling things out as individuals within a larger world of sensible and intelligible goods. In naming, we predicate properties of the things we identify. We say that this tree is tall, or as Dr. Quinn said this morning, this chocolate pancake is the best one you'll ever eat, or that this man is an astronaut. In naming, we also evaluate things. We affirm that this tree looks great in our backyard, that this is the best or worst cheeseburger we have ever eaten, or that this man is terrible at hanging towel rods. I'm not saying someone's ever said that before, but it would be an example. Uh, these paradigmatic activities of naming are ordered to one another. 
when we conclude that this one is a human being, a someone rather than a something, we discern not only the class of beings within which, within which they belong, we also discern the obligation we owe them. While we may use a hammer, a person we may not. The various paradigmatic acts of naming in turn may be performed using various linguistic operators. For example, we may identify someone by a proper name, Neil Armstrong. We may identify someone by a demonstrative, this man. And we may identify someone by means of definite descriptions, the first man to walk on the moon. Furthermore, in naming, we perform various speech acts. We may assert Neil Armstrong is an astronaut. We may question, is Neil Armstrong an astronaut? We may command, Neil Armstrong, become an astronaut. We may exclaim, Neil Armstrong, what an astronaut. Each of these speech acts, moreover, have different conditions for success and take different stances on the relationship between word and world. Well, as we noted above, God deploys the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming in revealing himself to us. Scripture identifies God by his proper name, Yahweh, by various titles such as God Almighty and God Most High, and by definite descriptions such as the one who was and is and is to come, and as the one who brought Israel out of Egypt, as the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Scripture, moreover, predicates various things of God, employing a wide variety of verbs, adjectives, and nouns. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yahweh is gracious and merciful. Yahweh is king. Scripture also evaluates God, extolling his greatness, honoring his majesty, and thanking him for his benefits. In each case, however, Scripture deploys the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming in an extraordinary way, thereby conveying something of God's transcendent uniqueness, incomparability, and worth. Again, Basel affirms that although the Spirit has often made use of various forms of creaturely discourse, he is in no way enslaved to these forms, but rather changes its expressions to suit its needs for the moment. So, for example, God's proper name Yahweh, according to Turretin, is so peculiar to God, and you know this is, is true, it, it's uniquely applied to God in Scripture, this proper name. There's a big debate about this in the 17th century with Socinians about whether that's true. It's so peculiar to God as to be altogether incommunicable to creatures. Unlike creatures, God's proper name does not function to distinguish him as an individual member of a larger species. And that's true when it comes to Elohim and Theos, but that's a complicated thing. And leave it aside for the moment. Yahweh is God's peculiar and separate name. The name by which he is distinguished and set apart from all creatures and from all so-called gods. Similarly, in predicating various things of God, Scripture employs the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming in extraordinary ways. It predicates certain actions exclusively to God alone, such as the works of creation and providence, redemption and consummation. Moreover, in predicating various attributes of God that are otherwise predicated of creatures as well, for example, Yahweh is king, Scripture does not fail to emphasize both the uniqueness of God's attributes, God is the blessed and only sovereign, 1 Timothy 6.15, and it emphasizes the uniqueness of the relationship between God and his attributes. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. In thus appropriating the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming, Scripture conveys that God alone is light, that God is identical with light, and that God is nothing but light. In predicating things of God, Scripture thus refuses to locate God within a larger class of gods, or within a larger category of being that would include both gods and creatures. The same goes for scriptural evaluations of God. God's name is extolled as unique and incomparable. Thus, 1 Samuel 2.2, 2, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our rock. According to the Old Testament and the New, God's name alone is to be hallowed in heaven and on earth. Here we may agree with Brueggemann's judgment that God's uniqueness and incomparability is the extreme and most sweeping testimony given to Yahweh in Holy Scripture. What about the scope of divine naming? 
Scripture praises God's unsearchable greatness by means of an abundance of divine names. The tradition offers a number of ways of categorizing, categorizing this abundance of names, and we'll briefly observe just a few examples. Gregory of Nazianzus regards he who is, Exodus 3, and God, as names that, in a special way, signify God's being. He adds to this categorization two other distinct groups of names, which signify God's power and God's providential ordering, respectively. The first group includes Almighty and King, Beat of Glory, the Ages, or the Forces, or the Beloved, or the Rulers, Lord of Seboeth, which means Lord of Armies, Forces, or Masters. This is all Gregory. The second group includes God, be it of salvation, retribution, peace, righteousness, or of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or of all spiritual Israel, which has the vision of God. He then adds a point essential to pro-Nicene theology that distinguishes between names which are shared by the three persons of the Trinity, or the personal names, I'm sorry, shared by the three persons of the Trinity, in the second category, the personal names by which the three persons of the Trinity are distinguished from one another. I just almost became a modalist. Uh, fulfilling your wish. Uh. Augustine offers a similar scheme of categorization. Having ruled out eight of Aristotle's ten categories as irrelevant to the discussion of the divine names, which is anytime someone says, you know, the father's just were straight Aristotelians, it signifies to me they haven't read the fathers, right? Um, Dr. Quinn's nodding, so he's the Augusta guy, so I'm right. Uh, he he, he, he kind of scans through the ten categories, and, and eight of them he says, these are worthless. Can't do anything with these. It leaves him two. And he applies these to different categories of names for God those which can be said of him substance-wise, and those which can be said of him relation-wise. The former category refers to what all three persons hold in common as the one God. Again, same thing Gregory had said. The latter category names the ways in which the three persons are distinguished from one another, and, and this is, I think, a really important category, but very much neglected in kind of modern theology, the, the category of, of relation-wise names conveys the ways in which the one God relates to creatures as creator, Lord, and king. Augustine's scheme of categorizing divine names becomes categorical for treatments of the divine names in the broader Augustinian tradition. Look at Lombard, look at Thomas Aquinas. So much so that when Richard of St. Victor fails to address one aspect of the scheme for the sake of space, he's got to apologize for leaving it unaddressed. These are, these are dominant dominating categories. Reformers and Protestant orthodoxy continue to, continue to employ these and other schemes of categorizing the divine names, adding certain refinements to the discussion of God's relative names that are worth mentioning, if only for their deep pastoral significance. So Luther talks about God's friendly names when God is described as our shepherd, okay? where, where God is, is, is named for his grace and mercy and so forth. And he says God has some austere and 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 Transcendent names and these horrify us, but God's friendly names are a source of great consolation, and we should remind ourselves of these names. The Reformed tradition kind of develops this theme with the, the category of federal names. In other words, names which signify God's covenant relationship to his people. Okay? Thomas Watson, the great 17th century Puritan uh, preacher in London, at one point says, Eloha, thy God, is so sweet you can't suck all the honey out of it. Well, here we should add an important methodological point for the theology of divine names. The scope of divine naming sets the standard of divine naming, or at least a standard. A theology of the divine names must join all the glorious names, to use Wesley's language, in its account of the being, attributes, persons, and works of God. Things go awry in theological reflection when we reduce our attention to only some of the divine names revealed to us in Holy Scripture to the exclusion of others. And so, as you know, this is one of the common criticisms made of Arius and, and those who are identified as Arians, right? They, they basically reduce 
relative names to substance names. They ignore that there are more categories than one. I've made criticism elsewhere of certain modern theologians who focus so in on certain relative names related to God's historical relationship with his people to the exclusion of other names. It distorts the overall presentation of God. A second methodological point is that a theology of the divine names must also rightly construe the character and relationship between the various divine names revealed to us in Scripture. Things go awry in theological reflection when we misconstrue a name's significance or when we distort the relationship between various divine names. And again, using relative names as an example, uh, Augustine makes a point when he talks about God being described as creator, king, and, and so forth. And he introduced a category that will be developed later in the tradition of a mixed relation. Right? Uh, Thomas says there's no real relationship between God and creatures. Then it sounds like, oh, horrifying to us. There's no real relationship. Like God doesn't love us or something like that. But he means a very specific thing, right? The kind of relationship that God has with his creatures is one which benefits us and changes us for the better without changing God. That's, that's all that he means. Well, getting the nature of that relationship right is in some ways everything in a theology of God and of God's relationship to the world. What then about the ends of divine naming? There are three ends of divine naming that I want to mention briefly. The first end is hermeneutical. According to Gerhard, as we've seen, our theology in this life is almost completely grammatical. If this is so, then one end of the study of the divine names must be to gain greater fluency, both in interpreting and expressing the biblical grammar of divine naming. We study the divine names in order that we may move beyond mere reading of the sacred page to an understanding of the way the words go. We study the divine names in order that we may move beyond mere repetition of biblical words and orthodox creeds to the ability to speak fluently of God in our own context of prayer, proclamation, and praise. There's a further epistemological point to say there, but for the sake of time, I'll leave it aside. The second end is formational. The word of God in Holy Scripture is given to us that it might be implanted in our hearts, to use James's metaphor. The implanted word both conveys and forms within us spiritual habits, various forms of intellectual and moral excellence that are essential to the knowledge and love of God. And I'm very much attracted to the idea of theology as a habit. And so becoming fluent in the divine names is essential to the the formation of the habit of theology. The study of the divine names thus has a formational end. As we seek to gain greater fluency in interpreting and expressing the divine names revealed to us in Scripture, we also pray that the divine names will renew our minds, that they will plant the highways to Zion in our hearts, leading us upward to the one in whom alone our souls may find their everlasting rest. Third end is doxological. The Leiden Synopsis, 17th century manual of doctrine, brings its brief but penetrating analysis of the, of the names and attributes of God to a conclusion with the directive that we must acknowledge only him and we must bless, honor, worship, and serve only him and adore, praise, invoke, and glorify him in words and deeds. This is actually the goal and purpose of knowing God. More recently, Robert Jensen put it this way, the church has a mission to see to the speaking of the gospel, whether to the world as message of salvation or to God in appeal and praise. Theology is the reflection internal to the church's labor on this assignment. In both cases, the final end of theological reflection in the divine names is rightly identified. God has revealed his holy name in Holy Scripture, that we gaining fluency in and being formed by his holy name may, with everything that has breath, bless his holy name. Conclude with some brief uh, reflections on Psalm 145. Psalm 145, as you know, is the only psalm that has the title for the book of the Psalms. It's a psalm. It also functions as a kind of entryway into the Hallelujah Chorus of Psalm 146 and 50. It's an acrostic poem. 
And in a sense, I, I, I think that it means to present itself to us as a perfect praise of God. Praising God's name, as it were, from A to Z, not leaving anything out. The theme, I think, of the psalm is really twofold. On the one hand, it's the, the, the theme mentioned in verse 3. Great is the Lord, and abundantly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. And the psalm unfolds talking about not only the, the greatness of God, but the greatness of his goodness. It talks about the greatness of his everlasting kingdom. And it really kind of goes back and forth between various declarations of God's greatness with, uh, matched with the second kind of major theme of the psalm, which is not the greatness of the Lord, but the greatness of David's self-commitment to praising the Lord. Psalm 145 expresses a magnanimous self-commitment. It begins, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. And the psalmist goes on to commit himself to ensuring that the next generation will praise his name. And it concludes with the summons to all creatures, let all flesh bless his holy name. And so the idea is that the greatness of God summons and warrants the greatness of a self-commitment from human beings to praise his name. Well, when we think about the study of the divine names, we, we oftentimes think of, of the necessity of moderation, right? And, and we saw this with John of Damascus. Don't step over the bounds, right? Don't go past the limits of what has been revealed. The secret things belong to the Lord, revealed things belong to us, but we must not go any further. And that's true. And, and you look at the history of discussion on these things. There's often, at the beginning of a discussion of the divine names, a call to modesty and moderation, to temperance. But there's also a call to magnanimity, to attempting great feats, because God is worthy of being praised. Of course, we're all aware of our weakness and of our inability to fulfill such a magnanimous calling. However, our hope for fulfilling this magnanimous commitment lies not in ourselves, but in the triumph of the lion of the tribe of Judah. And in the seven spirits of God, he has sent out into all the earth. In Jesus' name and by his spirit, we may take all the glorious names ascribed to God in Psalm 145 and indeed in all of Holy Scripture upon our lips and join the blood-bought kingdom of priests in leading the everlasting chorus of all creatures in heaven and on earth, in the sea and all its depths, to bless his holy name. Thank you. All right, so I'm told we have time for questions, right? And Christy has a mic. So Mike. questions, comments, Criticisms of Augustine that you want Dr. Quinn to field? <laughs> um, okay, one. Uh, there's debate in Old Testament studies, that's my field, Old Testament, about the meaning of the name Yahweh. Mm -hmm. It's uh, pretty heavily debated. So I was wondering if in your work you've come to a conclusion about the meaning of the name Yahweh and just the significance of that name for your reflection, since that is the central naming event in the Old Testament. Question, so the meaning of Yahweh. Am I allowed to say that I'm a systematic theologian and yes. that's outside of my field? Yes, yeah. right. Um, yeah, uh, you know, last couple centuries there, there's been a, a criticism of kind of historic takes on the divine name, saying that they're all mixed up with Greek philosophy and that the divine name has reference to God's historical commitment to be with his people or the fact that he, he's the creator, and he brings things into being and so forth. Um, it was interesting, if you look at the history of interpretation, those kinds of interpretations are always acknowledged and usually, especially kind of post-Reformation discussions, they're included as part of it. Um, that said, I, I think that it's increasingly um, been demonstrated that the whole Hellenization thesis is is kind of a um, dumpster fire, uh, and it's I think it's been shown it's, it's bad history. 
And, and so starting with the Septuagint, as part of the history of interpretation of the Old Testament, we know how the Septuagint takes the divine name there as, as the one who is. Um, and we say, well, that's the Septuagint. Yeah, there, there's Hellenization going on. But the problem with that critique is that you have to say the Jewish interpreters, and not just Philo. Philo is the tip of an iceberg that, that is, is, is much bigger underneath them, but also the New Testament, right? So Revelation uh, 4, the one who was and is and is to come. Th I mean, this, that way of speaking is not unique to John. And it's not even unique to actually Jewish and Christian thought, right? Zeus can be described in this way. And so um, I, I'm, I'm getting a long way to get to, to, to an answer. I, I, I do think that something like, uh, it, it, I think it's, it says something about the self-referentiality of the divine name. But I also think it says something about his immutability and eternality. It's interesting how th that divine name is appealed to in context of historical change as the kind of anchor. And I think Revelation 4 is, is kind of a perfect example of this. God's people suffering. How can they be assured that he's going to make good on the things he's promised? It's because he is who he is. Um, the, the most recent study that I've read on this that I found very helpful is Andrea Sainer's book. Are you familiar with this? Um, Andrea Sainer, uh, it's actually her doctoral thesis from Durham. She worked under Walter Mobley. Mobley. And she interacts with all the kind of historical critical scholarship on Exodus 3 and other places, but then she brings Augustine in to say uh, he knew some things that maybe we, we don't. Um, and, and she's got a very convincing kind of case that this is a, a very legitimate way of, of understanding what's going on there and appropriating it. Yeah. Other questions? You mentioned that knowing God is is almost always grammatical, right? So if I'm I'm in international missiology, and I'm just curious if we're working with cultures who have no grammar for God or no knowledge of God, is there as a systematic theologian is there a starting point you might have because you have to present the triune God, but how would you go about presenting or representing God faithfully in a culture that doesn't have that grammar? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's. I think what it, what that idea of theology highlights is that uh, part of evangelism and certainly discipleship, especially in this kind of context, it is enculturation. Now, again, we hear that, and it sounds terrifying because it sounds like colonialization and, and everything else. But I'm not talking about enculturation into kind of Western ideals or, or, or whatever else, but there is an irreducible a matter of enculturation into the biblical world of meaning. Um, and so uh, I, I think that, again, I'm no missiologist, and, and, and I'll say things that are, are probably, you know, child's play. But I think that approaches that are heavy on exposing people to the storyline of Scripture, right? Uh, to understanding the meaning of, of imagery and so forth. Like, you know, there's the famous story that we all heard somewhere back in our missions classes, you know, about the you know, translators who uh, translating lamb, but there's, this culture doesn't know lamb, so you translate it pig, right? And, and it, that is like translate it so it can be relevant to the hearer, but the problem is when you call Jesus the pig of God, takes away the sins of the world, you also, also confuse them in terms of broader kind of internal biblical senses of things. And so I think there's an exposure to the biblical grammar. I also think this is, this is kind of um, the, the wisdom of catechization, right? Uh, catechesis is, I mean, there's a, way, there's a reason we teach languages the way we do. First you learn the ABCs, right? Then you, then you learn your, your grammar, and then you learn your, your logic, and then you learn your rhetoric. Um, and I think there's something like that that has to go on in theology as well. Um, it, it takes time to be enculturated in, in the Christian faith. And so I think the implications are, um, I mean, it's like Acts 17. Paul does this, right? He's talking about, he goes, has to go way back. He has to start at a different place than he does with the Jewish audience, right? He can't just kind of say, Jesus is the one the Old Testament talked about. 
He's got to go back and kind of fix their understanding of God. He's going to talk about creation and human race. And the end of it is what? We'll hear more from you on this matter. Like, it's going to take time to, to, to kind of do this. So um, yeah, that's all I got. That's, that's Great helpful. question. Thank you. Yeah. Got a question right here. Um, so this is just a follow-up on the answer you just gave. Yeah. Would you make a distinction when you say uh, in culturalization, in, I can't say that word, um, into the, the biblical grammar, would you make a distinction there between biblical grammar and theological grammar? And if so, how would you do that, and what would that look like? Yeah, I think so. I think I think you have to make a, dis- a distinction, um, although they're related. And, and the distinction is not one's in the Bible, one's not. It's the distinction between when you when you look at kind of classical understandings of the authority of Scripture, you often get a statement that it's not just the words of Scripture that are authoritative, it's the meaning of Scripture that's authoritative. And uh, the point is, you can know all the Bible words, but you can put them in wrong relationships to each other and end up saying unbiblical things. And so, I mean, this is, this is a lot of what the Arian crisis was about, right? And, and the church was kind of reticent to introduce new terms. But when it did introduce new terms, it was about saying this is the theological grammar of Scripture, right? It, it's, it's not biblical terminology, but it is biblical meaning, and it's clarifying biblical meaning. And so I do think those two things are, are different, and I think that this is where when you think of the idea of enculturization, you, you know, you've got – in a tradition, there, there's there's handing on of certain kind of knowledge and practices and skills, and there's receiving of them and so forth. And any time you have a tradition, in any sense, doing this, um, whether it's at the most basic level of catechesis of a child or whether it's the most advanced level of, kind of an academic dis- discussion, handing on a tradition provokes questions. And um, so there's are questions of, of, of you know, I don't know what this means or how is this relevant. But those questions, even though they're not in the text, answering them, right, in a way that's consistent with the text and, and, and then it, and it makes someone a kind of a, a fluent participant um, in, in a tradition, that also is part of the theological grammar, I think. And so... Um, that's why, right, that's why you don't just kind of take a video of yourself preaching and then mail it to another country, assuming that everything's to be addressed there. No, like, the passing on from here to there requires a knowledge not only of here, but also of there, and, and of, 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 of what, how, how you, how you pass it on. Even though you're, you're, yeah, it's, it's, you're not trying to kind of meet in the middle or something. There's there's a there's a norm um, and there's a receiver, but 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 the process of handing on will always raise questions. Um, and, and that it hasn't been passed on if the questions haven't been addressed. Or if you haven't said, that's a bad question, here's the question. You see what I'm saying? Like it's not saying you have to accept all questions as equally legitimate. Other questions? First, thanks a ton. That was great. I really appreciate it. I'm Mark Lederbach. I'm one of our ethics profs here on that. So it took, uh, this is a question that just it had to do with your intro and conclusion regarding Gerhardt's assumption that knowledge is primarily grammatical, I think mm-hmm. is the way you described mm-hmm. it. And I'm wondering if um, if you could speak to that idea of primarily or, or even almost exclusively, because I think about an ineffable kind yeah. of knowledge of God and how that informs us. So I wonder yeah. if you could just develop that a little bit. Yeah, so... Gerhard is is working here with a distinction between kind of our knowledge of God in this life and our knowledge of God in the next life. And, um, you know, he holds that our knowledge as pilgrims is very limited in comparison to what our knowledge will be in the new heavens, new earth, the beatific vision being central to that. Part of the distinction is not just the kind of extent of our knowledge, but it's the mode of receiving it, right? And so 
Gerhard holds and, and, and others, uh, what Thomas says, we talk about the beatific vision, all of our knowledge of God in this life is mediated knowledge. If we're talking about general revelation, we know the invisible God through his visible works. If we're talking about special revelation, we know God through the mediation of prophets and apostles, right? Knowledge in the next life will be immediate. Um, not that the mediator won't be there, but there's, we'll see him face to face as understood as being kind of knowing God directly by means of a vision of his, his being in essence and so forth. And so I, I think that Gerhard has a good point there. And the reason I like it too is because it's the point I kind of skipped. Um, we, we talk about God's knowledge of himself is infinite, inexhaustive, incomplete. Our knowledge of God is always finite, right, incomplete, true, right, reliable. It can lead us to the right place, but, but it, it's, it's not God's knowledge. Um, and sometimes there's worry when, when people say that, that, oh, so we don't really know God. Um, but the, the idea of theology as grammar and the idea of gaining fluency, I think, helpfully addresses that. And, and here's, here's the example I'd like to give. Um, a child can learn to sing a tune before they've ever seen a musical note, before they ever hear, if ever they hear, that there's a actually deep mathematics that informs music. A two-year-old can walk around the house and sing a tune, and she can sing the right tune. Okay, And I think that's the way of thinking of the difference between God's knowledge and our knowledge of him through the grammar of Scripture. The same thing with, with you know, baseball. Right, kid out there on the on, on, on the baseball that doesn't have to understand the laws of physics that make that possible, right? You you're gonna get it, and so we have a genuine acquaintance with God. It's intellectual, it's effective, it's uh, verbal, and it's but it's grammatical. It's mediated through Scripture, and 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 it's something we can gain fluency in, and it's on the path. C.S. Lewis talks about transposition, how you can present something from a higher register and a lower register, right? You can take a, a, a road and you can picture it in two dimensions by doing lines like this. And he says, isn't it interesting? You're, you're drawing an angle there where the road, the lines are parallel to each other. And you have to distort the lower register to describe the, the, the higher register. Well, I, I like to use that example because in a sense, the divine names are that two dimensional road, but they're actually leading us on the way. And their end is the vision of God. And so um, we know that it's two-dimensional, right? We know that we're just children singing a tune that our mother taught us. Um, but we can, we can know it's the right tune, and we can know the road is going in, in, in the right direction.